Welcome to this episode of On Finding Peace, brought to you by Life's Journey Life Coaching. Our host, Chris Shea, is a counselor, nationally recognized speaker, and author on topics of guiding us to finding peace in our daily lives. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com. Welcome, everyone, to a, another episode of On Finding Peace. I'm your host, Chris Shea. And this is the podcast where we talk about practical tips on ways that we can live daily in finding our inner peace and our happiness. We talk on topics of mindfulness and meditation and uh, try to bring on guests who can inspire us on what they've learned in their lives and bring in some of their own wisdom as to what they've done to talk about their own inner peace and how they have found that and lead others to that. And today for our ep- uh, podcast episode, I'm very pleased to have uh, as a guest, uh, Mike Bunderand, and he is going to be speaking with us about self-sabotage and what self-sabotage means and uh, what it does to us uh, against it. So uh, very pleased uh, to have Mike with us. Thank you for joining us. You bet. Thanks, Chris. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. Um, can you uh, take a moment and introduce yourself and let uh, people know, you know what you do, what you're about? Sure. Uh, my name is Mike Bundrent, and uh, my, my website is inlpcenter.org. We are an online certification center for uh, those who wish to learn neuro-linguistic programming. We train a lot of people who are interested in being life coaches, uh, a lot of uh, therapists and so forth, uh, sort of take our training. Uh, My background is mental health. Uh, I learned NLP when I was young in my 20s, uh, some 25 years ago, something along those lines. And uh, I was getting my degree uh, in psychology and went on to become a, a licensed mental health counselor in the state of New Mexico. And, and I, uh, uh, for the first 10 years of my career, uh, sat in that chair and uh, practiced counseling and uh, learned, you know, various different uh, counseling modalities uh, beyond NLP, of course. And, uh, but the, uh, opportunity to uh, train uh, has always kind of uh, been with me. I've trained in the United States and Japan and since 2011 been teaching uh, these skills online. Uh, And then I had the, a few years ago, I had the realization, of course, that, you know, as a, as a counselor, as a practitioner of some sort, you know, we all learn various sets of skills and interventions and ways to improve our lives and those of our clients and, and not all of them work. Um, You know, NLP, which, you know, has a reputation for creating change quickly, uh, being a powerful modality and it's got a bit of a bad reputation in many circles as well uh, for being manipulative and, and so forth. But, you know, in particular, I've noticed over the years that, you know, the really excellent, strategies that you can teach people with NLP. Uh, You know, it's one thing in the training room and when you're demonstrating it. It's another thing when you're sitting with someone who's really struggling, who has no interest in the technique or methodology that you're using. They want to get better. And at the same time, they're just seem to be resisting getting better. And you can throw the best techniques into the mix that you want. And often they they don't produce the results uh, that you would hope for. And so I started to think a little more deeply of what is it that sort of drives us toward negativity, almost on autopilot. Uh, Why do we end up, you know, when we come to consciousness, why do we end up with this critical voice in our heads? Why do we, in the spur of the moment, make decisions that ultimately lead us away from what's good for us as opposed to toward what's good for us. What is this inner drive that most of us seem to have that uh, 
that causes us to self-sabotage. So that's when we develop the self-sabotage work. And so it's just been my life is centered around uh, these areas, uh, fortunately, because it's what I've been passionate about since uh, I can remember. So that's a little bit about where I'm coming from. Well, I appreciate you sharing all that. And, you know, that sense of being passionate about what we do, that that's so important that it, it's not just that job, but it is part of your passion. And, and uh, I love to hear that. Um, yeah. Can you explain a little bit what is NLP for uh, any of the listeners who, you know, don't know what that is? I know in my psych studies, you know, we, we learned the basics of it way back when, but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, it stan- NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming, and I know that doesn't help. Um, it's kind of a, it's a complicated, uh, sort of not very descriptive name, but uh, NLP began in, the, in California, University of Santa Cruz, when uh, a small group of people got together to take a different approach to understanding what makes us tick, uh, and the approach they start, well, they began to take was uh, to find people who were exceptional communicators, uh, to find people who were getting the exact results that they wanted, and then go deconstruct what they were doing. So uh, Milton Erickson, the uh, famous uh, medical hypnotherapist, Virginia Satir, mm-hmm. uh, the family therapist, uh, Fritz Perls, uh, Gestalt therapy. Uh, they spent time studying with, and in many cases, spending time with these exceptional therapists and began to look at the work, not from what's wrong with the client, but you know what is the therapist doing to facilitate change. And they began to break down the therapist's gifts, if you will, into formulas, for lack of a better word, that became teachable. And that's how NLP got started. And moreover, most of all, they took this sort of mindset that if anybody is doing something well, let's go figure out what they're doing well. And that included looking at people who had overcome problems to figure out how to work with phobias, for example. They, they didn't study people who were phobic. They studied people who used to be phobic and had overcome it in order to figure out what mental process did they go through? How could you think of a snake and panic And then uh, ultimately end up thinking of a snake and remaining neutral or remaining alert, but not panicking. What it's just, it's the same snake either way. What transition happened in your mind that you now are responding so differently to the snake. And then they developed a process to take people from phobic to non phobic uh, modeled after people who had, been through that process successfully. So many of the NLP techniques are based on uh, modeling people who do things well. What, how do naturally slender people make food choices versus people who have overeating problems? So, you know, one thing to do is really understand and break down what's going on with the person who's overeating. And there's value in that. That's a more traditional approach and there's immense value in that. But what, The piece that NLP filled in is, what about the person who knows exactly when to stop eating and makes good food choices all the time and remains slender? How is their food decision process different? And what can someone with an eating problem learn from that? So a natural, naturally slender eating strategy was developed. So it's this approach where I think um, NLP adds uh, a lot of value and we kind of break down the mental thought processes in the very specific structures, what you see in your mind, what you hear in your mind, what you feel in your body. And we break that down even further to understand the structure of those things so that these phenomena become highly teachable and uh, eventually a 
NLP was sort of set up as a grassroots movement uh, um, and it remains so to this day, but there has been some structure to the field. Uh, there are certification programs for people who want to learn uh, the different uh, interventions and, and so forth. And, you know, it's been, that was back in the early 1970s and now here we are. So it's shown some staying power at any rate. Right. And, and it's really shown some efficacy in, you know, the work that's being done. And, mm-hmm. you know, what I, what I really like with it is that part of that piece, as you just mentioned, you know, is the education. And one of the things that I've found in working with uh, clients is, you know, if you can help to educate them as to understand what's going on and what they can do different instead of just telling them something. Yeah. that seems to make that world a difference. Yeah, I agree. I, I think you're right on the money with that one um, to, to be able to give people specific, um, not just uh, things to do in the world, not just actions to take, uh, but specific mental processes that they can go through to put themselves in a mindset where they're more likely to take those actions. That sort of ramps up the, the likelihood that you'll be effective for sure. Right. It, exactly. So now, you know, you start taking that NLP and start, you know, shifting that in, into, you know, like you're saying and what you're working with the self-sabotage and um, how do you find that that becomes useful in that work? And what, what have you, I, I don't know, maybe changed is the right word or maybe more if, you know, from the, NLP to make it fit the self-sabotage. Yeah, it's a little bit of a formula. So if you're using uh, NLP and let's say that you uh, give somebody a, uh, teach somebody a new strategy for, you know, making a really good decision and, and rehearse that strategy with them so that they, they've just, they've got it down. Or you teach someone a new strategy to motivate themselves or you name it, just about anything. It's like, I've given you a, just the perfect tool to do the job that you, that you want to do. And, uh, but then they still don't use it. And uh, when I say they, I'm certainly including I in they, because I, have been known to suffer from the same thing. It's like, we know exactly what to do. We know exactly how to do it. We still don't do it. Um, Or what happens when you set a goal um, and then, you know, you do really great 90% of the time, but you know, there are key points in which you just stop caring and you don't want Mm -hmm. the goal anymore. You know, I, you know, set a goal to eat a certain way and I do really great. And then from nine o'clock to nine 30 at night, <laughs> I stop caring and we can destroy all of our progress really quickly um, and get in our own way. So there are times when even though we know specifically what to do and the vast majority of the time we're convinced that we want to do it, we still don't do it. And so sometimes it's not a matter of not having the right tools or the right skills or the right opportunity. Sometimes there are moments when in spite of being set up for success, we uh, find a way to talk ourselves out of it, to uh, sort of make the opposite decision anyways. And I wanted to know what's going on in that case. And, and so after explaining how we, you know, NLP and modeling and studying solutions rather than problems, I actually decided to study the problem in this case, to, mostly within myself to find out what is it? Um, it's as if a part of me isn't on board. It's as, as if a part of me um, wants the opposite of what I think I want most of the time. And and so we sort of introduced the conscious unconscious model. Um, consciously, I want to lose weight. Unconsciously, um, I don't want to lose weight. I want to stay at the weight I am. And so at key points during the day, my unconscious motivation comes out and, and ruins things. Consciously, um, I want to get a lot done. 
unconsciously, I prefer procrastinating for whatever reason. Um, I may unconsciously fear being successful. I may, whatever the resistance might be, the whole idea is that consciously we can be thinking and wanting one thing, but unconsciously be motivated towards something else. And if we are not aware of, uh, accepting of our unconscious motivation, then it can continue to very frustratingly run on autopilot. And we don't develop choice about it. And you cannot make choices about that of which you're unaware. And so I started to think, if we can figure out what's going on unconsciously, does it, is it true that maybe a part of us really does want something negative? I mean, if you sort of, you know, I would look at my life as if it were a movie and analyze my behavior over the last 30 days and go, do I really want what I thought I wanted? If you take my all of my behavior into consideration and you look at that and go no because if a part of me weren't uh, I mean a part of me must want something else because I'm not doing it so what is that motivation and how do we access it and change it and so forth and so this is really a matter of defining a problem well just figuring out what's going on that's outside of my awareness so that I can apply the tools and skills that I have to that space. Uh, it's really about sort of de-repressing unconscious motivations. And once we're aware and accepting of them, now they're on the table and we can begin to work with them. That's kind of how it all fits in. Yeah, and, and especially when you're looking with those unconscious motivations and, you know, that at least the way that I, you know, look at the self-sabotage is, is where the key piece actually is, and I, I think. And what, what can we do to, to try to bring those motivations more to light? Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if you know, like in what you're saying, it, it's that difference of, of the conscious versus the unconscious. And, right. you know, I, how might I try to rework that within myself to work more on, you know, making the, the un, uh, you know, the, the unconscious blend and, you know, meld a, a bit more with my conscious uh, work? Yeah, that's a, just a, that's absolutely the, the right question. So I appreciate that. Um, the first step is to consciously allow for the idea that something else is going on. In other words, let's say that, you know, I've got a promotion at work coming up and, you know, I need to, you know, prepare for the interview and get certain things done, get my ducks in a row so that I'm really in the running for this promotion and um, I think of myself as a successful, upwardly mobile person, and I'm all about that. And yet, for some reason, I keep procrastinating doing what I need to do to bring this to pass and starting to fear that I'm going to end up, uh, you know, up for the promotion and not, not really be ready, not really be putting my best foot forward. And yet, I just, you know, when it comes down to it, I'd rather watch TV. I'm just making the wrong choices as opposed to doing what I need to do. So the right. first step would be to, um, is to kind of make an assumption, but it's not, uh, it's not really a leap. Uh, and the assumption is part of me doesn't want what I consciously want. There's a part of me with an opposing motivation. And in this case, it would be um, a part of me wants to, you know, fail this promotion. A part of me wants to stay stagnant. A part of me wants to stay where I am. Part of me is not invested in the success for whatever reason. And this is often the biggest uh, and most important step because consciously I may be so convinced of who I am when there's really more to me and I'm really uncomfortable with the idea that 
part of me doesn't want to be successful. A part of me is maybe more comfortable with mediocrity or something. Consciously, I don't want to accept that idea. And I think it's because usually I believe if I accept that, then I will enable it and it will come to pass. And that's what Freud called magical thinking. I believe that if we Mm -hmm. acknowledge uh, our thoughts or if we think a certain way that it will affect reality and, and come to pass, which typically doesn't happen. You know, when you face the demon inside, you find out that the demon inside isn't what you feared it would be uh, and so forth. But that's often the hardest uh, part, which is saying, you know what? It's true. Um, Somewhere inside of me, some part of me is resisting doing what I need to do. And it's a powerful enough part of me that, you know, every evening I procrastinate and waste time and wake up the next day frustrated. This has got to be dealt with. And so I'm just first going to accept what's going on. Uh, Part of me is resisting. And that is, again, it's often the biggest challenge because uh, we think if we accept it, then it will come to pass. But nothing could be further from the truth. If we accept it, now we're in a position to be able to consciously learn more about it and potentially do something about it. Uh, now we're, we have our feet on the ground and we're in reality. Uh, and that, that would be the first step uh, in in a process that, uh, you know, intends to deal with the issue. So that part that's holding me back, the piece that I use for that self-sabotage, what you're saying is that that's the actual piece that I need to accept and say, yes, this piece exists. Mm -hmm. It's real. And why is it here? What do I do with it? Yeah, exactly. Um, you need to put yourself in the position where you face the problem as opposed to um, hoping the problem will go away, uh, fighting back against the problem, saying, no, I'm a successful person. And that's, you know, I don't have some part of me that, you know, sort of clinging to your uh, sense of who you are consciously. Um, you're not going to make a lot of progress most likely that way because it's a way of denying the problem and you can't solve problems that you deny you have. Right. Well, exactly. And isn't that the first step of any self-help program, you know, is to identify the problem. Amen to that. Um, Absolutely. You know, yeah. So that, that to me is, is, you know, the key. I mean, if I don't have a problem, I'm not going to make any changes in my life. Yeah. Um, But I I think too, you know, when we talk about the self-sabotage and, uh, so many people go through that. Do you think this is something that is natural, normal, and typical for uh, the majority of people? Or is this a, a small subset uh, of our population? I mean, well, what have you found? Yeah. Um, I, Based on my experience, um, I, I tend to believe it's universal uh, that – it's sort of like having an inner critical voice. Uh, most people can identify with that, right? Uh, self-sabotage, uh, I think, is part of the human condition. And I would qualify that by saying um, it's on a spectrum. Some people get a really heavy dose of it. Uh, there are people who uh, really suffer immensely with it and inflict pain upon themselves and uh, Uh, really, really struggle to an extreme degree. And then there are other people who get a lighter dose of it. But I've I've never met anyone uh, that didn't have something of self-sabotage within them. I I believe that uh, it forms, the tendency forms in childhood well before we have any choice about the matter. And and really just being born into the world and uh, going through the process of socialization. And there's no way to escape the, the pain and negativity associated with that process. If you think about, you know, the condition in which you're born, no boundaries, no sense of other people and that 
they have limitations, no idea of what's safe and not safe. And so, you know, you, you kind of grow up uh, or, or you're born kind of expecting your needs to be met immediately because you don't have a sense of time and that, you know, mom can't give you what you need in the moment because she's in the middle of something else and it's just going to be a few minutes and don't take it personally and try to be patient. I mean, a baby doesn't understand that. And as well as the two-year-old that wants to stick the keys in the light socket or, or whatever, the one-year-old who doesn't understand that that could uh, be, that could kill her. And so mom and dad, you know, take the keys away and, and, and that, and that baby is just enraged Right. So there's no way just in the process of bumping into our limitations, other people's limitations, the number of times that we have to hear the word no and and that it's very, very upsetting because we don't understand what's going on. And so there's it's sort of like saying, you know, would be expecting a child to grow up and never cry and never be upset. And it just doesn't happen. Negativity is part of the process of growing up. And then when you throw into the mix less than loving parents and uh, even abusive or neglectful parents, the negativity is just compounded and it it's part of the process. And so, what happens is the only way, and this sort of goes back to um, sort of psychoanalytic, the psychoanalytic days of Freud and some of his colleagues, Edmund Bergler, uh, uh, who is not a well-known name um, at all, but he would kind of be the driving force behind a lot of this thinking, is that one of the things that happens in, in the face of all this negativity is that the only choice we have as children, it's an unconscious choice. The only move that we can make is to learn to tolerate it. And, uh, and that it becomes very, very familiar. And even something that we learn to tolerate so well that we can even get a kick out of. And so the small child who learns that uh, if he does a certain thing, it pushes mom's buttons and he gets scolded after a while, he starts toying around with the idea of pushing mom's buttons to get that reaction out of her and giggling while he does it. He actually learns to enjoy the process of getting into trouble uh, and sort of being rejected or scolded a little bit. I mean, we have to work it into who we are and learn to tolerate it. And needless to say, the negativity becomes very familiar almost like an unconscious uh, bias. In other words, uh, what's familiar to us is, is safe. What's familiar to us grows on us. Um, mm -hmm. And if we are raised in this stream of negativity, um, the stream of negativity is, becomes a familiar rut. We end up unconsciously choosing the, you know, uh, the devil that we know right? And so there's some motivation that if I have this stream of negativity, I want to pop out of it and go over here into being deliriously happy. But the negativity is so much more familiar, it will actually appear safer. Um, at a deeper level, I'll be more comfortable with the negativity than with the happiness that seems foreign. And so we have this... Uh, bias toward the kinds of negativity that we were raised with and that uh, the more positive alternatives are foreign to us and consciously very appealing and we think about them and fantasize about them. However, there's this strong unconscious draw toward what we've always known because it seems safer and so we end up with these dual motivations. Consciously, I want one thing. Unconsciously, I want to stay in the rut that I'm most familiar with because right. safety. So that's kind of how it develops. And it can be very, very powerful uh, in our lives. We just don't want, it's very uncomfortable to see it and, and admit it, right? Because uh, we don't want to enable it further.
So do you think there's that connection then between when you talk about that familiar, uh, the notion that change, even if it's for the better, uh, typically can be very scary for us because change is an unknown. So Mm -hmm. even if I'm told it's for the better, it's an unknown, therefore I'm going to stay where I am. Right. And I would take it a step further, even if I have evidence that it will be better, um, even if I fully believe that it will be better, I still may be highly motivated unconsciously to stick with what's familiar uh, to me. Uh, just on the basis of the foreign nature of the change that I want, that I, I, I've never been there and done that, I don't know what that's like um, that alone can be uh, a very, very powerful concept. The, the idea of familiarity, being safe, is extraordinarily powerful. Right. Even if it means staying in a, in a stuck situation and consciously I have these hopes and dreams of bettering myself, but I'll, I'll stick in this situation. You bet. You bet. Yeah. Uh, in, in many ways, that's... Uh, part of everybody's story uh, when moving forward and doing something that you really want to do. Um, in many ways, when we aren't motivated or don't do it or get in our own way, self-sabotage, uh, and that's it, usually the reason why I find. Right. Yeah. And, and yeah, and, and that makes sense. And, and I think people can relate to that because, as you say, I, I don't know of anybody who hasn't, to varying degrees, had that experience. Yeah, you bet. I mean, from relationships, it's like, why do I keep in uh, finding myself in the same relationships that don't work and inviting the same kind of people into my life and I may even see the red flags uh, but then talk myself out of ending the relationship or talk myself into attempting to change this person and all the while kind of maybe knowing I'm fooling myself a little bit I mean why do I end up in relationships with the same people who uh, either control me or reject me or deprive me in some way Um, this in many ways is the story of our lives in terms of why do we keep doing the same things over and over again that consciously we're not happy with. And and it's interesting in in how you put that because when I've looked at this concept and, and I wonder if others do the same thing is we tend to flip the conscious and the unconscious. So, you know, like you're saying, you know, people are staying in these situations more for that unconscious self, sabotage you know don't want to make change consciously i do want to make the change i've always wondered if it was the opposite that you know consciously i don't know what to do where maybe subconsciously if if i just you know dig deep within myself i can find the solution yeah i think that's a that's a really interesting concept and i think there 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 could be cases where unconsciously I am motivated towards something positive. Consciously, I don't know what to do. And the challenge may be to, in that situation, to consciously accept that you need to learn what to do. Um, You know, there may be an expectation you should know what to do, but if it's something new and different, um, maybe there's a skill set, a capability that you have to, um, you know, develop something along those lines. And I, but I'm in favor of uh, flipping conscious and unconscious uh, perspectives because one of the really sort of counterintuitive but mind-blowing things that I like to do with clients is to say, you know what, for 20 years you've been telling yourself you want X but getting Y. And so why don't for a week you just – Tell yourself you want why. But the problem, and the problem with that is, um, let's say that I go through the day feeling like people don't like me. Essentially, I go through the day feeling less than. And I don't want to feel less than. I want to feel confident. I want to feel like I'm part of, not an outcast, I'm part of what's going on. And yet, 
I get these signs all day long every day that people are, you know, not open to me or accepting to me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we can flip the perspective and I will, you know, after a fair amount of rapport building and, and education on how conscious and unconscious motives can work along lines of what you and I have been talking about here. I'll tell people, just try an experiment for a week, which is assume that your goal every day is to feel like an outcast. Assume that your goal every day, rather than to be accepted, is to be rejected. Because it's as if you have an unconscious bias toward rejection. It's almost as if you have an unconscious goal to to feel that way. And it's obviously a very familiar feeling to you. Consciously, you don't want it. I don't want it for you. But let's just do uh, a role reversal here and take the perspective of your unconscious mind, if you can accept that your unconscious mind has this bias. So people will do that. And uh, they'll sort of wake up and go, okay, today I have a goal to experience rejection as much as possible. Or if it helps to see today, I have an unconscious goal to experience rejection as much as possible. And they'll go through the day and they will be shocked at how they fulfill that goal. And mostly it's on the inside. In other words, they walk into the office and they'll walk past someone who doesn't acknowledge them and they'll immediately go, that that person doesn't like me. And they'll feel rejected and uh, they will text somebody and not get a reply back within 20 seconds. And they'll go, see, this person doesn't want to talk to me. It's this tendency to interpret everything in terms of uh, the, uh, in terms of what's familiar. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And when consciously they're going, oh, I just did it again. I did it again. I'm sort of looking at the world through this lens of, Every nobody likes me and I'm interpreting everything as if that were true. And I'm, it's no wonder I'm in this rut. And then after a week of doing that, they start to go, do I have to do this? I mean, is there another option? Um, When they can start to get their mind around it and now it's on the table And interestingly, many of the strategies that we counselors and coaches uh, teach people in order to reinterpret things, look at things differently, respond differently, now a lot of those techniques really become much more effective because the unconscious motivation is on the table and has been on the table. So it's really counterintuitive. A lot of people are afraid to do it because they're like, well, if I go through life with the goal that people are going to reject me, they're really going to reject me. But that doesn't happen. Um, For 20 years, you've been seeing the world this way, and lo and behold, that's what you've been experiencing. We're going to do something very different that won't enable it. It will actually uh, sort of bring the splinter from under the surface of the skin to the surface of the skin where ultimately you'll be able to pull it out. Uh, But right now it's buried and festering under there. And that makes perfect sense, you know, and, and to me it's perspective shift. And if, if we are looking for change in our lives and trying to find, uh, you know, more of a, a peaceful, center to our lives we're going to need to shift our perspective on life you know it's, it's not just going to happen um, I, I agree yeah yeah and, and that's what makes this topic so important because you know the the self-sabotage you know is going to stop me from uh you know examining that change and and taking that risk to go out into the unknown you bet you bet and You know, in many cases, um, the unknown really is the unknown. So in this example of me sort of going through the day every day for decades, um, feeling like I'm an outcast, uh, well, during those however long I've been doing that 20 years, I probably really have missed out on a lot of opportunity to interact with people. And through those interactions, develop skills 
there's probably a lot of communication skills and so forth that um, I could begin to develop. And once I'm past, once I'm off autopilot and have addressed this bias toward rejection, I'm now in a position where I'm no longer biased toward rejection. And there's an adjustment period where I get to learn all about communication skills and negotiation skills and and to reinterpret everything and, and interact differently. And that adjustment period is an opportunity to make familiar what was what was unfamiliar. It's, it's a phenomenal opportunity. Well it, exactly and, and there's a level of excitement within that. And hopefully we can grasp you know, that, that excitement and, and move into, uh, you know, the, this unknown opportunity, uh, you know, with that perspective versus, you know, the, oh, no, what is this going to be? Well, you know, let, let's be excited about, oh, what can this be? Exactly. Exactly. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that, that's the hope right there. Uh, it really is an opportunity. So in terms of something practical, that people can do about this. Um, you know, if you're, if you're listening and you are intrigued by this idea, uh, a quick way to experiment with it is to think of something that you want that you're not getting and think of it in terms of what you are getting. And so in the promotion example, it's like, well, I want the promotion. I want to succeed and I'm not getting it. What am I getting? Well, I'm getting procrastination that leads to mediocrity. Okay, that's what you are getting. Now that you've identified what you are getting uh, and possibly the feeling that goes with it, uh, the feeling of kind of emptiness that goes with mediocrity or the feeling of you know, being a failure that goes with mediocrity. Okay, well, that's what I, you know, procrastination leads to, and obviously I procrastinate. So um, the next step would be to assume a part of you wants that. And again, big, big step to go a part of me or unconsciously, I want to procrastinate because that leads to mediocrity and an empty feeling on the inside. That's a tough one to say, right? Um, however, if you say that, it does, doesn't make it, uh, it doesn't enable it, doesn't guarantee that it's going to happen. In fact, if resisting it more likely guarantees that it's going to happen. And you go, okay, a part of me wants this. And then begin to go through the day every day with that awareness that a part of you wants it. Now your mind is open to it. You can start asking questions. Um, how did I learn to want this? Who taught me that this is what I, what's right for me? Um, how is this sort of mediocrity and empty feeling on the inside? How is this the devil that I know? How is this a familiar place to me? And then start to catch yourself in the act of moving toward that place. And so it occurs to you that, oh, I've got to do this report so that I'm all ready for work tomorrow or whatever. And you go, ah, no, I'd rather watch a movie. And right in that moment, you go, I'm choosing to watch a movie, procrastinating my report so that I remain committed to mediocrity and the empty feeling on the inside. And it's just that level of honesty about it. It sort of envelops a deeper motivation into your conscious awareness. Do that for a week. And typically what happens is after you're comfortable and aware and understand what's going on, uh, your consciousness has now expanded. And as your consciousness expands, so does your conscious choice. Typically, what will happen is people start to question what they really, really want. It's like I've been on autopilot toward mediocrity for a long time, and it leads to an empty feeling, and that empty feeling is really, really familiar. Isn't it time to become familiar with a more fulfilling result? 
typically people's minds start to move in that direction. So think of what you're not getting. Think of what you are getting that you don't want. Assume a part of you does want what you're not getting. Accept that and find, catch yourself in the act of getting it every single day in a very accepting way and notice what happens. That's what I would say to do on a, on a practical level. And, and that does seem very practical because, you know, that is something that I can do and, and it seems to be a, a really good shift in, in perspective. Yeah. Um, yeah, you bet. So if people want to learn more about, you know, what you do and, and how you work with NLP and, and, you know, the self-sabotage, what's the best way for people to get uh, in touch with you? Yeah, uh, it would be to go to the website, inlpcenter.org, inlpcenter.org. Um, I have another uh, website called ahasystem.com, A-H-A system.com. That's more it's a smaller website. Uh, there's a free ebook on that website that kind of gives a, a rundown of the concepts uh, you and I have been talking about, Chris. Um, and they, people can go, you put your email address in and, and you get an email with the ebook or something along those lines. And reading that ebook, it's called Your Achilles mm -hmm. Eel. It's on Amazon too, but you have to pay for it there. If you go to ahasystem.com, you can get the free ebook. Read it, and you, everything you'll need to know to contact me and so on and so forth is, is on the website. And uh, I'd be happy to answer questions and, and so forth. This uh, We developed a system called uh, Aha Coaching where uh, – part of what we do we train people who want to become life coaches and they start out in NLP training uh, and then when they get to the life coach certification part of what we teach them is called aha coaching where they learn to uh, work with people uh, on these issues uh, using what we call the aha solution which is the program that deals with uh, self-sabotage so uh, there are uh, a number of uh, trained coaches that uh, can work with people along these lines. And every once in a while, I also uh, take on a new client. So uh, lots of opportunity, but just through reading the materials, um, you know, you can learn a lot. Sounds excellent. So I, I definitely encourage people to, you know, check that out. And I appreciate your time and all of the, uh, knowledge and insights that you've been able to, uh, you know, give to all of us the practical tips. This is a great method. And I think it's, you know, something that is good to begin to explore that so that, you know, people who are looking to find their inner peace, one of the things that, you know, we really need to start working on is, you know, what is our self-sabotage and following the tips that, you know, you've shared how do we break that and start working to change? So uh, really appreciate your time and, and coming on the podcast. You bet. I really appreciate you uh, having me and uh, asking such great questions and, and being open to the discussion. So thank you. thank you for listening to this episode with Chris Shea. Learn more about Chris Shea by visiting his website, www.lifesjourneyblog.com.